Breathe on us, O breath of God. Fill us with life anew, that we may love the things you love and do what you would do. Breathe on us, O breath of God, until our hearts are pure, until with you we have one will to live and to endure. Breathe on us, O breath of God, our souls with grace refine, till every earthly part of us glows with your fire divine. Breathe on us, O breath of God, so we shall never die, but live with you that perfect life in your eternity. Amen. What an honor it is to be back here at the Divine Mercy Conference after 13 years I was scheduled to be here in uh, 2000 for the conference and at the last minute had to, I didn't, my doctor cancelled. Uh, Don spoke of high blood pressure and mine was off the wall, so to speak. I had a blood pressure crash and I had to stay home, whatever. Never dreamed I would get back to Dublin one day again, but he dreamed. We're here speaking of remaining in his love. God's love is so persistent, my sisters and brothers. If we only knew how much he yearns to hug us and love us. We look for love all over and yet he is right there just waiting to hug us. As Sister Katrina put it this morning, waiting for us to give him permission to hug us and love us. God wants to love us. And yet we run chasing love in so many places. I didn't know God's love. Growing up, it was there. Excuse the pun, but I had to be blind not to see it. His love was there. I was born the 17th of 22 kids in the family. My parents weren't pro-life, they were pro-love. They loved recklessly without worrying whether another child would come. What are the chances in this world of a 17th child being conceived, let alone be born and grow up and live? I was loved before I knew it. As a child of nine, had TB meningitis in a coma for three and a half months, five months in a hospital. My parents wouldn't give up. They were called fools for hoping for my life. If he lives, he can be nothing but a vegetable the rest of his life. You've got a good looking turnip in front of you too this morning. I came out of the hospital after five months, unable to walk, unable to see, and with no memory of the first nine years of my life. My brothers and sisters taught me to walk again. It was an advantage of coming from a large family. You had a lot of therapists around. <laughs> and to the amazement of the watching professionals, they taught me to walk again. And when all the eye specialists said nothing could be done for my sight, pinpoint central vision returned after a year. With that pinpoint vision, I went through school, competing with my fully sighted friends, relatives, neighbors. But I can't say that I knew God's love, even with all of that. 
Can you see God scratching his head and saying, how many miracles do I have to work for this bloke before he knows, before he believes? Because I still didn't. I saw happiness in life for me would be the day nobody would know I was blind. Even with the return pinpoint vision, I was considered still legally blind. And by my teenage years, that had proved quite an obstacle to normal living. My dream came true. Labor Day, 1960, probably the most exciting day of my life. I stood on the prep school steps of the Brothers of Christian Instruction, 16 years old. I watched my folks, gray and red Ford station wagon, disappear down the monastery hill. Homesickness gripped me like I had never known, but also excitement. Nobody in that prep school knew that I was blind. The brothers had answered my request for information with a request to come and interview me at home. Well, at home I knew where the steps were, I knew where the doorways were. The brother came and interviewed, never thought to ask me if I was blind, and I just never thought to bring it up. <laughs> I was accepted to enter the brother's prep school as a 10th grader, and that was exciting. Until I got there, and I'm trying to make out the writing on the side blackboard. You know, with pinpoint vision, I had to go around each letter to figure it out. Well, much to my fright, I figured it out. It said intramural sports. There was my name on a football team, a soccer team, and a baseball team. I didn't know what to do. I played sports for three weeks. Going to bed with nightmares of my skull going 14 directions at the same time on impact with that little rock they call a baseball. I would love to have been a fly on the wall the day the director called home. They knew something was wrong, but just couldn't put their finger on it. <laughs> he called home and he said to my mom, we know there's something wrong with your son, we just can't figure it out. Oh, no, no, academically he's a whiz, he's top of his class already. You know, spiritually he's edifying, not a problem at all. But physically, he's clumsy as heck. He bumps into doorways, he's no good at sports. I'd love to have seen his face when my mom interrupted and said, didn't he tell you he's blind? That night, I was read the riot act by that director. Why in heck didn't you tell us you were blind? You could have got killed out there. And I said, you're telling me? <laughs> that man became my staunchest advocate after that. I guess he figured if I was fool enough to try all that, they might as well be foolish enough to give me a try. And it was with his help that I went through the brothers prep school but you know, my dream never changed. I'll show them I'm as normal as anybody else. I graduated from the brothers prep school, second of the senior class. Made it through the brothers novitiate. Went off to the brothers university. The director of student brothers said to me, now come on, we know your blindness, take all the time you need. Yes, a normal brother goes through in three and a half, four years, but you take five, six, whatever years you need. I said, I'll show them. <laughs> I went through in two and a half years instead of four. <laughs> Made it to the brothers, through, got my degree and everything of this sort, and then heard the brothers' school say, how is he going to be able to teach? How is he going to teach a classroom full of kids when he can't see two of them at a time? I got so angry. Haven't I proved I'm normal yet? When are they going to believe I can do anything any normal brother can do? It seemed like, you know, the carrot in front of the, the donkey, as soon as he gets to where it was, it's, it's on ahead. 
And I, I just could never succeed in convincing them I could do anything that anybody else had to do. I got assigned finally to the brothers' boarding school for 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth grade boys. I was promised 12 6th grade angels. I got to the boarding school and the principal handed me my class list, 40 8th grade monsters. <laughs> he said to me, do you want me to tell the kids that you're blind? No, I said, they don't need to know I'm blind. I'll be a normal teacher. I'll teach just like anybody else. Nobody has to know. The kids at our boarding school, many of them were from troubled homes. One third of them had different names from their own parents. Many had gotten kicked out of their own schools for discipline problems. Many had flunked out for academic problems. We even had a few who came to the school because they were too young to go to jail. They'd gotten into trouble. There were kids, in short, who needed that extra ounce of attention, love, and support. The principal said to me, do you want me to tell them that you're blind? No, I said, I'll be a normal teacher. And so a normal teacher I tried to be. I'd run up and down the aisles, slide between the desk, look over there and call on the kid over there. Never let the kids know where their teacher was looking. <laughs> and then two things happened. One day after class, one of my eighth graders came up to me and said, Brother Pat, do you have barrel vision? And I panicked like they've guessed my secret. Good teacher knows you got a question you don't want to answer, you answer it with another question. I said, what would make you ask a crazy question like that? He said, well, sometimes I have my hand up and it's like you don't even see it. You don't call on me. I said, well, if I called on everybody that had his hand up, you guys would have me on tangents. I'd never, you know, cover anything in the classroom. He said, I know we've tried that, but you don't bite. <laughs> a few weeks later, another kid came into the boarding school in trouble with the law. Bitter against the law, bitter against his parents, bitter against the school for accepting him. An angry young man. Leaving my classroom one morning shortly after he had arrived, he attacked and plowed me in my left eye eight or ten times with his fists. Planting the lens of my glasses in the flesh of my eye, blood splattered. Now he had to get kicked out of our school and off to another school, a mark on his record. He had struck and drawn blood from a teacher. The doctor pried the lens out of my eye, my face swelled level shut. He said to me, you can kiss the little bit of sight you've had goodbye. A traumatic blow like that will ruin it forever. Go home, lie down, and pray. I don't know what else to tell you. It's interesting when even a doctor tells you to pray. We don't see that too much in today's pagan world. I went home and lay down, but I can't say that I prayed all that much. One thought kept thundering through my head. Would the kid have struck his teacher if he had known his teacher was blind? How many kids' lives was I entitled to ruin by trying to be somebody that I wasn't a so-called normal teacher? The kid made out well in life, probably thanks to the blow. And I know I made out well in life thanks to that blow. I decided to quit teaching. I apologized to my students for not telling them I was blind. The boarding school needed a library, and the principal asked if I would set to work setting it up, and so I did. I ask God every once in a while, do you get excited when you see us finally on your track? He must have been excited at that moment because I fell in love with library work. But I learned a lot that I didn't know in the library, that I needed more training, more studies. And so I worked to get a degree, in, a master's degree in library science. But in those days, you couldn't get into the university without a graduate record score. And of course, I couldn't take those time tests, so I, how would I get in? Well, 
I decided I would write to a foundation and try to get a grant to pay for my education. Universities won't say no if I get the money. And so I wrote to the chairman of the board of the H.W. Wilson Foundation, one of the largest library companies in the world. How was I to know when I wrote to him and told him about my blindness and not being able to take time tests? How was I to know that he had just undergone his own second cataract surgery, putting him in a rather sympathetic mood to get my letter? <laughs> he wrote back and said that Wilson couldn't give to individuals, but could he help me personally? And there it was, with his help, I got a, a full grant to go to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. to pursue studies for the master's degree in library science. And there it was that I discovered talking books, things I could have used all my blind life but had known nothing about. And because of that, I was challenged to get into the work and my order, the Brothers of Christian Instruction, gave me permission to get into the work. I was hired by the city of New York as Brother Pat to roam the streets of the city, find the disabled throughout New York City, and help them find the city's services. It was interesting. I'd been working there for probably two or three weeks when I got a call from one of the big muckamucks in the library system. The, the boss of my boss's boss, you know, that type of a thing. And she said to me, Brother Martin, I'm sending Mary Engels down from the Daily News. We want to do the story of your blindness in the newspaper. I said, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need the publicity. I want to be a normal librarian. I was a slow learner. I want to be a normal, li I want to be just like the rest. I don't want special attention. And I hung up on her. It took about two minutes for her to dial the phone back. And she said, I don't remember asking you any questions. You came here to spread services for the handicapped. Your story in the paper will spread services. Mary Engels is on her way down. You better cooperate. And she hung up on me. <laughs> Mary Engels did a beautiful story. Brother Martin's mission to spread the recorded word. That one article of my blindness found 165 new users of talking books. It was wild. I looked at the article in disbelief. The thing I had hated most in my life, my blindness, was actually the gift I had for God's people. It blew me away absolutely blew me away. All sorts of incidents like that began to happen in those street days of New York City. People I was able to help because I was one of them. The man who was deathly afraid of, of even trying to use the talking books and I laughingly said, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. Oh yeah, you're one of us. You're one of us. The blindness became more and more the gift. It was incredible. And then it was the disabled themselves, as I visited, who said, why couldn't you be a priest? Why couldn't you be a priest for us? Well, in those days, you couldn't be a priest if you were blind. But God knows no limits with his love. Pope Paul VI granted an indult in 1978, just before he died, for me to be ordained a blind priest, a priest for the broken of this world. It was mind-boggling how my blindness, and I, my prayer, my fondest prayer growing up was that God would get rid of it. Isn't that our only answer to suffering, huh? Get rid of it. And God is much more creative than that. I call God the master recycler. <laughs> he takes the garbage of our life. He didn't make me blind. God made eyes to see. But the world made me blind. And look what he did with it. I was asked to speak to a group of 600 high school kids in Burnaby, British Columbia, Western Canada, in 1988, 10 years after I was ordained a priest. 
And after I finished the talk, those 600 kids rose to their feet. They were humbling. And one of them came across the empty floor between the bleachers and me. And he took the microphone and did a traditional thank you. And then he ended his thank you with words I will never forget as long as I live. He said, Brother Pat, we, the students and faculty of Holy Cross High School, want to thank you today for being blind. Would you thank somebody for having cancer? Would you thank somebody for having a broken marriage? Would you thank somebody for having heart disease? He thanked me for being blind. Well, you can't thank me for something that isn't my doing. You can't thank me for being a man. I had no choice before I came out of the womb. He thanked me for being blind. Was blindness my choice? Not on your life or mine. Then how could he thank me? I was pondering his words that night in prayer. I said to God, how can he thank me for being blind? Like, I, it's not my doing. And then all of a sudden, I saw three men carrying crosses up to Calvary. Two of them were kicking and screaming all the way up. But one had embraced his cross. He took the cross that we laid on his shoulder, embraced it in love for us. And I saw the answer. Yeah, the day I embraced the blindness, instead of praying it away and fighting it away and wishing it weren't there, the day I embrace it, the way you embraced the cross we hoisted on your shoulders, that's the day people can thank me for being blind. His love just never quit. All these years, his love never quits. It's, it's mind-boggling. We put conditions for his love. Well, if this happens, if that happens, if this goes away, if, that get, if, I, if I can change this, I came to see God didn't love me in spite of the blindness. He actually loved me with it. And it's his love that's given me a happiness, a peace the world can't touch. In closing, I was on a retreat. 1977, preparing for what was supposed to be my ordination to priesthood. At the beginning of that week-long retreat, my director said to me, if you could have whatever you wanted from God, what would you ask him for? And I said, oh, you're probably going to laugh, but please don't. If I could have whatever I wanted from God, it would be a picture. A picture of what, says my retreat director. I said, a picture of him. He said, you want a picture of God? I said, you got it. He said, you want a wallet photo of God? I said, Father, young man, young lady, fall in love. What do they want? They want each other's picture. Show their world. Look, the one who loves me. Look. I said, can you imagine if I had a picture of God to show the whole world? Look, world, the God who loves me. He said to me, I've got a silly feeling you're going to get your picture this retreat. <laughs> I went walking every day during that retreat. It was in Portland, Maine, northeast corner of the States. And I, I never dared walk in the same part of the park two days in a row because I have a nasty habit. When I go walking on my own retreats, I love to sing. I sing right out loud. I have a philosophy of singing that goes very simply. You have wonderful voices like our music ministry. Well, you sing as loud as you can to praise God for it. You have a voice like mine. You sing as loud as you can to get even. <laughs> it, was, it was the sixth day of my retreat. And I was walking in a park in South Portland, Maine, near the base of the Million Dollar Bridge that spans the Portland, Maine Harbor. Hands were in my pockets, and I'm singing away at the top of my lungs. 
when all of a sudden I stopped dead in my tracks. How do you sing a song you've never heard before? I stopped. The song did not. The words, the melody kept flowing. I ran back to the retreat house faster than my legs would carry me. Dug out my love letter notebook. I always write a love letter to God every night. I'll be talking about that in tonight's healing service. But I write a love letter to God every night and that dug it out and wrote down in 15 minutes six verses of a song I'd never heard before. Can't figure out musical notes, A, B, C, D, and all that stuff. So I dug out my trusty tape recorder and taped the song so I wouldn't forget the melody. That night when I went in to see my retreat director, I brought the tape recorder and I said to him, God sent audiovisual aids tonight. <laughs> he chuckled as I plugged in the tape recorder and pressed the play button. But when the song began to play, my retreat director began to cry. And he cried all the way through the song. When it finished, he looked at my dry eyes and he said to me, Patrick, don't you see what God did for you today? I said, talk to me. He said, talk to you? What did you ask him for six days ago? I said, oh my. I asked him for a picture. And can't you just picture God looking down and saying, the poor dummy, has he forgotten he's blind? I'm going to give him a wallet photo so he's the only one who won't be able to see him. <laughs> so in his creative love, our God gave me a wallet photo that I could hear. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me as I am, oh yes, he loves me. Yes, he loved me yesterday, yes, he'll love me still tomorrow, for he loves me just today the way I am. He loves me, he loves me, and all he asks is that I let him love me. Let him love me as he chooses, with no thoughts for wins or loses. Let him love me as I am, is all he asks. He knows me, he knows me. Better than I know myself, oh yes, he knows me. Who I was the other day, and who I will become tomorrow. But he loves me just the same, the way I am. He calls me, he calls me. He calls me as I am to spread his love. Knowing well who I have been, who I will be, who I am. Yet he calls me just the same to spread his love. He frees me, he frees me. He frees me to say yes whenever he calls me. Showing me his own compassion, love and care and understanding. He frees me to say my yes when he calls me. He loves me. Me. He loves me as I am, oh yes, he loves me. Finding me wherever I am, he gently guides me by the hand. For he loves me as I am, oh he loves me. For he loves me as I am, oh, he loves me. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.